Hello everyone, this is the first YouTube video, YouTube series, podcast series of how to be a football coach with myself, Joe Pike from JP Football Training and the first guest, I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, Ross Embleton, uh, Leighton Orient head coach or current Leighton Orient head coach should I say. Uh, it's great to be on Joe, thanks for having me mate. That's right, Th- thanks for coming on, obviously times like this like we just said it's a bit uh bit crazy but it's not not going too bad and stuff but what the main point of this podcast and everyone listening in the video it's where i'm at in my journey and how literally as the title says how to become a football coach so with you and yourself kind of where did it all start obviously i know you had a bit of a plane at Leighton orient and then do you want to just explain from yeah. that <laughs> Yeah, loosely, loosely. I I was all right. Um, I was released at just before I left school, really, like very, very close to to the end. So I probably felt like I was going to get a full time or a scholarship, as they're known now, um, youth team contract, whatever at the time. But but I was released um, just just literally just before I was about to finish school. So I sort of never really had any plan because I thought that was where it was going. Um, and I was very lucky that at my school at the time, they'd just started off the sort of first, um, you know, like now uh, clubs are linked with schools and their yeah, kids yeah. go into a, into a school. I was, my school had done that with Arsenal. Um, and the, and the, 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 the boys went into the school at year nine and, and through, and then the college boys uh, joined at, at my age group. So um, I was in the, in the same year group as all of their youth team. And my school sort of said to me, look, we know you're, scrambling around a little bit come in and do the same course as the Arsenal boys but you can go off and explore your coaching opportunities so my first experience was helping out on like Saturday morning soccer camp soccer yeah, yeah. school hour was, and that a half. With, was that with Arsenal yeah or was that just that was with Orient it was with oh, Orient yeah, at the cool. time um because that's that was where I grew up um it was a mate of my dad's he had 100 odd kids uh it was before the time of you know academies here there and everywhere and we had 100 kids over right by the stadium and up tied their shoelaces, you know, referee, make money. Uh, and that was sort of it, really. And, and off the back of the opportunity at the school, school suggested in me doing a PEA level, Orient sort of said to me, come in and we'll quick get you into some primary schools, get you doing some after school clubs and sort of build up your coaching hours from there. So I was very lucky that a lot of it sort of came together for me and it kept me studying a little bit, albeit I was at, you know, wasn't very good, um, but it got me out coaching every day. And my, my journey sort of started at sort of 16 really. So um, I wouldn't say at any time or way, shape or form, I had in major direction of what I wanted to do, but it was about just going out and working with kids and, and enjoying kind of doing a- something with was it kind of with yourself? Obviously, myself, it was, I wasn't good at playing football. I was like, I want to be in football, so coaching, and that's my passion. Obviously, like you said, it was kind of a bit, oh, well, I haven't got a, a scholarship or, or a deal or anything. And were you kind of just like, yeah, I'll take it? Was that kind of your, or were you thinking like in the long yeah. term, that just purely? I f- no, no, I, I, you know what? I, I can honestly say, I can honestly say until the job, now that I'm in, mm-hmm. there's never really been a longer term view to, to, to what I wanted to do as be, uh, in my coaching. But obviously, there's been stages where I thought, oh, I really like this. I wouldn't mind doing more coaching. You know, some of the jobs, I'm sure we'll touch on it, but some of the jobs that I've been in, they've become a little bit more focused around like development and management. So I haven't actually been out on the grass coaching as much as I'd like. So then mm-hmm. there was points in my career when I've looked and sort of said, now I need to do. I need to be back out working with players more, and stuff like that. But there was no real sort of end goal or real direction. It was just I love coaching. I loved working with kids, um, and 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 at the same time, it was a way for me to sort of work my way through college because, mm. um, like I say, felt like it was important for me to stay on at sixth form and and try to come out with some sort of qualification. Um, so it was literally as loose as that, really. And, and, then, and then, like I say, you then start to realise there's a little bit more behind it, like any industry, yeah. but there's a little bit more to it and you can start to become a little bit better in the way that you go about it. When, obviously, 
you got to that stage there and you kind of, how many years did you do that for? Like kind of with Leighton Orient, like kind of soccer schools type thing? So I went through college really. So obviously from sort of 16 to 18. Um, then when I, when I left college or, or that sort of came to an end, uh, I was very lucky that uh, there was a bit of a reshuffle around and I'm sort of taken in as like an assistant in terms of, um, you know, being around the programs a little bit more in the office, a little bit more yeah. learning about how you take bookings and, you know, simple things like that. At that um, stage, where, where were Leighton Orient at the time? Uh, league two, um, oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, for league two at the time, um, and it, for me, like it was always a club that I'd grown up around. So I lived in Walthamstow, right on top of the ground, near enough, and um, it was a club that obviously I played there as a kid. But I used to, you know, I went on the first ever football camp that the club ever ran um, with the local council and stuff like that. So it was a club that I'd always been really, really closely linked to, and and had followed the club. Um, you know, like I had a season ticket with my mates and yeah. followed them in you know, the more local away games and stuff like that. So, um, but at the time, yeah, like I say, sort of 19, went into that a little bit more um, in, the, in football in the community and started to get a bit more of an understanding of like arranging sessions and you know, building relationships with school teachers so that I would um, so I'd go out and get the Get get the business and then go and coach rather than just being the bloke who turned up with the balls on the you know at the playground. Did you? Obviously, it's it's hindsight and you can kind of look back now and look back at that time, like you said. Do you think so many? And this is just a kind of a question, a weird question, really. Is it kind of from your time there, like you said, you were coaching, but you're also seeing the the back end of it, kind of how to organise it, how to do that. Do you think looking back, that's it might or it might not at all. Has that helped you at all now, the further up you've gone, obviously in the pro game, looking back and kind of realising, and when you speak to younger coaches like myself or anyone like that, it's like you need to understand the whole picture, not just you're a coach and a manager and can you understand players? Yeah, yeah, massively. And you know, like um, people talk and say, you need to take yourself out of your comfort zone you need to do things that you're not got a great knowledge on or you're not got great experience on in order to build up those different understandings, different situations. I think like when I think back, I was sort of 18, 19 and going into schools and sitting down with a, with a great respect, with a grey haired air teacher, a head teacher who must have looked at me and thought, who's this not in those little kid coming in to try and organise business? And I, you know, potentially at the beginning of it, I was probably terrible in the way that I actually approached those conversations and meetings but like anything until you do it you don't learn yeah. um and i think like like things like that so it, it's got absolutely well it has in in the, in the bigger scheme of things but if you relate it to coaching it's got nothing to do with what i do out on the grass about mm -hmm. teaching a career turn or you know working on someone's finishing but i think in terms of building like rapport and building and understanding the relationships with people as, as I've gone into what I'm doing now, I realise how important those things were because as a young coach or a young development officer in some of the roles I was in, I was always the young one in the room. And I know that I would walk in and people would think, what's he? Who's this guy I think he is? Like, no, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I felt like I was always respectful and I think I'm still in touch with a lot of those people now that, that were senior people around me. But... Um, at the time, I could feel it. You know, I'd walk in a room and I'd probably have a tracksuit on in terms of, you know, representing the club. And a lot of the other more senior people would be in a suit or, you know, at that stage in their lives where they were office based people and probably looking at, again, looking at me as if to sort of say, where's this guy come from? <laughs> so you've got an organ, all, all, one, you haven't got a playing background and you, you know, haven't got a particular name that you can rely on. But then at the same time, you know, very, very young, you, you, you need to try and show and earn people's respect. So I think now when I look at how I build relationships and work with players or staff or supporters, senior members at the club, all those sorts of things, now I look back and I think, yeah, that grounding was massive for me. Do you, it's kind of those little bits of, I say like little bits of nuggets that you pick up along the way. Obviously now you can look back and it's like, hmm, well, that actually did help me or that like that bollocking or that, when you when you say you yeah. walk in in the tracksuit and everyone's in a suit and you think, well, then no one's going to respect me now. But you're like, well, I don't know, so I'm just going to try until I fail, type thing. Yeah, and and failing is there's nothing wrong in failing. 
you know, like now there is, if I fail in the job that I'm in, I'm, you know, I'm going to get absolutely tortured. But I think there's nothing wrong with failing along the way. And it's all part of your, all part of the process of getting to where you want to be. And I had a, I had a boss at, at, at Leighton Orient Community Programme who um, I've become incredibly close to. He was an usher at my wedding. He was, um, he's my little girl's godfather. Uh, and he was incredibly ruthless. He was a big, powerful, imposing guy, ex-fireman who'd come into into coaching football quite late. Um, ruthless personality in terms of the environment that he built. You know, if you'd done something wrong, he was on you. Yeah. But he was also like the you know biggest liberty taker in terms of the stick he used to give you and all those sorts of things. But it was a brutal uh, experience and place to be part of. And he used to throw me into things. And I was so far out of my depth. Um, and I used, to, I used to go red. I used to like, you know, sweat it like under so much pressure. And I always remember him doing it to me with, um, with a kid's football presentation. I used to go along with him and for years, he, we'd, we'd stand up on the stage and he'd do a big speech, make everyone laugh. And then I'd give the trophies out. And then one day I was standing in front of all these parents and he went, right, everyone, well done. Great season this year. Ross is going to hold the presentation today. No, no preparation whatsoever. And I'm talking two, three hundred people. How old are you at this point? Uh, 19, 20. Jeez. And I melted, melted like I'd probably never melted before or since. Um, and, and people like now that, I, that, that were there um, still bring it up. Like I, that was, uh, oh, oh God. Um, um, but the way I spoke was, was just horrifying. Um, but I never felt that intimidate or much, yeah. much more intimidation like that ever again, because he just went, he must've looked at me one day and thought, yeah, he's ready. And just threw me in, threw me kind in the of deep that, end. And, kind of that sink or swim type thing, isn't it? He's probably thinking, yeah. is he ready? We'll yeah. soon find out. And then it's kind of, that's his way of doing it. Some people on the other hand, a lot might kind of money cuddle you and go through, but like you probably know of now with some of the people you work with now kind of, well, let's see how let's push him. Let's see how far he can actually go. And yeah, and, and you know what? I didn't, but by no means, by the, but I embraced it that day and I had a right go at doing it. I was horrendous. So, by no means did I swim. Do you know what I mean? I sunk yeah. on that day. But what I did do is from then on, if I ever went to an event with him, I was always prepared. Like, even if it was just having a couple of things that I could refer to. Um, that if he threw me in the deep end again, which he did, and then other times he didn't, probably make him trying to, you know, trying to find new, new ways of testing me. Um, but it made sure that I was always, always like, always prepared and on my toes if it ever came up again. And I think those things like that, as, as, as terrible as they are, they, they definitely make you a stronger person. Hundred percent. You kind of put on it there about when you were a development coach. I believe you were that when you went to Bournemouth. Is that, is that the case? Yeah. Kind of, yeah, so I mean, there was a long, there was a long, go on, mate. Did you go there kind of after this kind of stage at Leighton Orient or where? where yeah, was yeah. So I, I, my pathway for Orient was, was very, like, very quick, very, you know, very steady. I ended up running the, 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 the holiday camp program, the schools program. That was a big part of what I did. And then slowly, obviously then by then I was getting into my early twenties and, and realizing that football was a career that I wanted to go into. Um, very much loved the community side of it. So it wasn't again, really about me trying to strive to be a coach at any particular level. It was tr trying to be really good at what we did um, within there. But I'd started to obviously work within our academy. Uh, I did a year, maybe even about, about 18 months of voluntary work. So would go and watch coaches. I'd watch the first team. I'd watch the youth team. Never and, and again, never for any money. And then I'd become sort of that coach that when so and so couldn't make it, or this you know under 13s mm -hmm. coach was stuck at work, I'd also take them because they knew I was there. They knew I was keen. They knew I was whether mm -hmm. I was any good or not. But they knew that I was. Uh, I had the right sort of attitude towards it. And like I say, did 18 months of of voluntary work to get more experience about better coaches, better people, better, um, better way of working with, with, with better players. Um, so I sort of become like a bit of a skills coach within our academy as well as my full-time job. And I used to work with all the seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 year olds. 
What um, were you doing? Were you, so, so were you doing a full time job alongside this as well? Yeah, but but uh, I mean, as you can imagine, the, the academies didn't look, or they were centres of excellence at the time, so they didn't look yeah. anything like this. It was it was very much like minimal amount of staff, um, and then age group coaches that all worked part time in the evenings and at the weekends. So um, I would do my full time job in in the in the daytime in the after school clubs and etc. like that, and then I would jump in my car and get myself over to where we were training in order to support and and do some, you know, like one-to-one work, some skill sessions with some of the age groups so that I had a foot in the door, but at the same time I was developing alongside that programme. So um, it was quite a natural progression for me. And then I was very lucky that at sort of 25, I was about 25, and the, the whole of youth development in the country was in a bit of a transition period. And there was about six months left of the season and the, the uh, Centre of Excellence manager or academy manager, as people would know it now, he left. And there was a sort of a gap of, we don't know where it's going, we don't know what it's going to be. So I, they put me in the role alongside the guy, Grant Cornwell, that I mentioned just now. And, and I sort of managed the academy with him until the end of the season to just get it through to the end to see what was going to happen. Um, we got it through to the end and then all the decisions were made about finances and how these centres of excellence were going to carry on. And they offered me the job full time. So at sort of 25, 26, I've become a head of youth development at a League Two football club, which was um, mind-blowing responsibility because I was managing a lot of people that were part-time, but they were a lot, lot older than me. Mm. Um, I had to manage things like, you know, finances, timesheets, you know, all things that were very, very office-based, had to organise all the fixtures, um, you know, health and safety, children's well-being, all those sorts of things, and manage the whole programme, which came away from me being an actual coach on the on the grass a little bit, but a, a massive job for me. And that was probably about, like I say, when I touched on there, going to the youth development seminars with guys that had been in their roles for 10, 15, 20 years. And I was walking in there as a 25-year-old, not... You know, not having much of an idea of how it, was, how it all worked, but trying to get to grips with it. But fantastic job for me. Um, but I left after three years because I felt like I really had a bit of a direction of where I wanted to go and what I wanted to be. But because I was the only member of staff or full-time member of staff in, in that department, I never felt like I was developing mm. my knowledge. I never really felt like I was developing myself because it was just me and I was so engrossed in the job. Did you think you were getting to that kind up. of ceiling point where you were like, I'm doing so much for, for this kind of, like you said, that air of the academy, but you, you weren't kind of, do you think, pushing yourself as an actual coach and getting to where the, maybe at that time where your aspirations yeah. wanted to go? Yeah, so I sort of become that coach of like, right, the under nines can't, can't make it tonight, so I'll take that session. Uh, my only real session, proper session every week was on a Thursday when we had day release from school. And the under 16s would come in, and me and the youth team manager would split the group and stuff like that. But that became my only day of coaching, de- designated coaching. So it became cool. hard. But at the same time, I was putting all these plans in of you know how I felt was the best way to develop players, what was the best strategy to have from you know eight to eleven and twelve yeah. to sixteen and all those sorts of things. But it was all off my own back, and I felt like I wasn't going in and picking new things up every day. And an opportunity came up for me to go to Spurs. Uh, where I worked with people like John McDermott, who's got an incredible you know, history in, in developing players. Alex Inglethorpe, who's now at Liverpool. Chris Ramsey, who actually had been my coach at, at Leighton Orient, but magnificent you know, As a player, coach yeah. development background. Yeah, he'd been my coach at, at oh. Leighton Orient. Um, and, then, and then he was at Spurs. Perry Suckley, you know, some pl- real experts in their areas of, of, of coaching and development. So... I went there and I, and I worked at Spurs in the academy for, for three years, which was, um, was, again, another fantastic opportunity. But again, it was very much a development role rather than a coaching role. Um, so I learned incredible amounts. I learned incredible amounts about coaching. You know, I got real exposure to watch people like uh, AVB work, Harry Redknapp, the way he was with the people, uh, Chris Ramsey, Les Ferdinand. Like I say, all those people that I mentioned before, and I, you know, had a three-year period of doing that. But again, it wasn't coaching, mm. um, and I started to feel as though I, I wanted to, to to be involved in that area of of the game. 
and that's when the opportunity to go to Bournemouth as the under 18s coach came up. Do you think kind of obviously a lot of people like that I speak to and a lot of people that you probably know and friends of your family, people like that, and they think, oh, how do you get into football? And obviously, like, how to be a football coach? And it's a lot of people say, oh, it's luck this, it's luck that, or it's who you know, it's this and that. I kind of think, and you might be able to back up on this, no one sees the the four, five, maybe sometimes people, sometimes people do it for like 10, 15 years of free volunteer work, giving up your time, giving up this, yeah. taking peanuts, really. And then, yeah. like we said, it's kind of, you, you've earned that. You've kind of earned your stripes in terms of people are like, well, yeah, but you know so-and-so. I'm like, well, yeah, but you don't know that I'd, I've been doing this for eight years and I've been giving yeah. up my life, really, I, in that sense. I agree. And I think the thing is with it is you know you might know person A. You know, mm. you might know Alex Ferguson. But you ain't met Alex Ferguson by being his, you know, growing up with his kids and going around his house. You've mm. got, you've, you, you might have got to know Alex Ferguson by those years of commitment of, you know, picking the phone up to him and going to watch his coaching, going to watch his teams play, going to watch his, you know, going to, going and being part of, you know, and giving up time. And and I think that's the thing that's very, very easily missed in anything. You know, mm. if, if you look at footballers, people just think they're good footballers, but they don't realise that they were like me and you. And when they were six, that's all they ever wanted to do. They wanted to be a footballer. Yeah, and they were fortunate enough to do that. And I think that can easily get forgotten. And I'm not sure if I said it at the beginning, but I think the, 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 the real thing is, is about how many different opportunities you can embrace in order to make you, yourself better. And some of them, are, most of them are going to take um, a commitment of some sort that there's no reward at the end of it. And I think that's, um, I get that question a lot of how do you end up in this role? And yeah, hundred percent there's luck. 100% is oh, yeah. luck because circumstances have to change and be manipulated and fall into place for you to get that responsibility or that opportunity. You have to be in the right place in terms of, you know, you might want to be in that role. You might have a connection with someone who's making that decision. So again, that, that, that does fit with, with, with those claims, but at the same time, you've, people have got to feel as though they trust you. People have got to feel as though you can do the job. Otherwise it'd be suicide for them to put you in those positions. And I think, you earn those credibilities, one by being good at what you do, one by being dedicated, but at the same time by showing that will and that that desire to be given those opportunities. And like I say, I was, especially when I look back at my first major role at Leighton Orient as head of youth development, yeah, I was in the right place at the right time, but I'd worked and, pe and shown people that I was, you know, very conscious of the way that I work and I had a good attitude, I was hard working. And I'd also been dedicating myself to go and watching everybody. So mm. as soon as that decision became one to be made, I'm sure the people that made those would have gone, well, like he's sitting on our doorstep. He, he's in the right place at the right time. So that element of luck is there. But also, like the yeah, lads a grafter, yeah. he, you know, yeah, he, 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 he shows he's, he's willing, but, he, you know, they must have thought I was capable as well. So, um, but I do think those those those. those claims or those thoughts are out there with people that is that you oh. just walk into those positions 100 percent. so you obviously at this point now you're how many years as a coaching more than 10 at this point at Bournemouth yeah I would say I went to Bournemouth when I was 28 I think uh, no maybe 30 I think yeah it was yeah it was 30 so you're talking by then probably you know about 13 14 years yeah. of coaching you know and it's very interesting because I, again, jumping ahead, but I remember going into my first interim role here as, as I took the team for three games after the manager had left uh, three years ago. And the director of football stood up in front of everyone and said, yeah, he's been coaching 20 years. And I stood there and I thought, oh, have I? <laughs> oh, like, I have. I've been coaching 20 years. Like, I was 36 and I thought, yeah, I left school at 60. And, but it never dawned on me like that. Mm. And when people went to me, I'm like, yeah, but you say he's coaching. for I'd been coaching for 20 years and albeit never saw that picking the player up and doing his shoelaces up on a Saturday morning as the relevance. But it was the start of something, do you know yeah. what I mean? It was the, all of those hours and minutes go into, into, making you, into making you what you are. So, yeah, by then I was 30. Um, I had two kids, so moving house was massive. We moved from, from where we lived 
in Bishop Stalford down to uh, down to Bournemouth, which is a beautiful part of the world. Mm. There was no hesitation on that front, um, but it was a big thing to do with two young kids and a family. Yeah. Was that a that's kind of a good point to go on? Obviously, we all know as coaches, no matter what level, as that's grassroots, one to one, or Champions League pro level, you have to give up so much. And obviously, yourself, obviously being a local lad and presuming your family all live around there as well at that yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. And then to tell, go home one day to your, to your wife and say, oh, we're going down to the coast. And she's probably thinking, bloody well end. <laughs> yeah. And it's kind of, yeah, what, yeah. what was that kind of move for you? And at that time, did you look at it like, well, what if this doesn't go well? I don't know, some people think like that, but was it like, yeah. what well, if this doesn't work, like, is it okay to fail? And obviously you touched on it, it is now. It's, of course it's okay to fail. But at that point, did you yeah. think, how far that could go. Obviously, Bournemouth were in League Two at the time, were they? Yeah, we're in League One at the time. They were they were in League One, but um, it was very like massively amount of, of thought that went into it. You know, I wanted to do the job. I think she could tell that I wanted to do the do the job as it became more looking more likely that I would would get offered to do it. Um, I think. You have to make mistakes and you have to foul, but at the same time, when you've got a family and a mortgage and a you know and huge responsibilities, failing becomes even more of a of a test. I think I totally understand that people would settle and be in a job for a long period of time and, and comfortable and and know that they're not going to rock the boat because it's an incredible rock. I've been through it a few times, and you know I've put my family through nightmares in terms of some of the jobs that I've I've lost in the situations that we found ourselves in but like I say when you when you sort of start to strive for something or you feel the opportunities are right it has to be right by everyone um, but we knew that once we sort of started looking in the area we you know the cost of houses and all that sort of thing was going to fit with the way that it worked for us um, we knew it was going to be a massive gamble but um, the 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 opportunity to do what I was about to do was was huge. And, and I think the other thing as well is that moving to a new place, I soon realised how many hours you work. So we were down there and my missus had two young kids. We had, my, my daughter was three and my son was only one. Um, we had So we had two young kids. She was stuck at home all day with no real sort of network of friends or anything. And then I sort of started to realise, bloody hell, I don't know, I put in some hours. <laughs> um, because I wasn't at home quite as much as I, as you know, as you would have liked to have been, you sort of started to realise it then. So it, it wasn't just the financial commitment and the upheaval of moving out. It was also that commitment to the job and commitment to your career that I was then sort of become a little bit more aware of. Mm. Do you think, obviously, when you're there now, so you're in Bournemouth, you're coaching this obviously full time and everything. At what point towards the end of it do you like, or did at any point did you kind of go, I wanna like, this is definitely like I wanna go into first team? Or were you very at that time were you were you just like, Oh, I'm happy in the academy, I'm I'm I like doing this? It was really interesting, is that um I went down there with a total focus on being a youth team manager. And I, I really do pride myself in every job I've been in or or gone into. I've always really thought to myself, now I'm going to be the best I can be. Mm. Now, I'm not going to, not set out to be the best in the world, but, you know, because they're huge, huge targets to try and achieve. But I, that I'm going to be the best that I possibly can at this job. Mm. Don't get me wrong, I've messed a few of them up and I haven't been very good at some of them. But I went down there really trying to embrace that opportunity of being the under-18s coach. There was never any thought process of, oh, if I take this one, I, I might be able to climb the ladder or if someone loses their job, I might I'll be, be in the to. first team. Never, or, yeah. yeah, there was never anything like that. Um, but I got, on quite, I got on quite well with the, the, the people who sort of appointed me. Um, they used to pull me into some conversations and meetings about how they thought the team was playing. And, and to be honest, they got off to a real bad start and struggled and, and, and were sacked after 10 or 11 games, which was just before Eddie Howe was brought in. Um, so there was, never any, no, there was never any thought process about that. And, I, and, I, and I've maintained that until I'm in this role now, that I've never sort of really thought about they got to a stage where I wanted to work in, in first team football, don't get me wrong, but there was never a stage where I sat there thinking, if this changes, I could be the manager here. Yeah. That was never my focus because I always had 
reservations about me being in a role like that because you know I haven't got a big name and it was always about me trying to be the best coach that I could be in, in, in the roles that I was in. So Bournemouth taught me an incredible amount, an incredible amount about not being able to trust everybody that you think you can trust. Um, Do you think a lot of people we, don't know that in, in the game? Do you think not just coaches? Yeah, yeah. Do you think a lot of people, kind of fans, people looking from the outside in, they, I know a lot of people that think it's, oh, it must be great to work there. And I'm thinking... I, I, I think they think two things... I think there's two two among many things, but two things that always jump out at me. One is that there are little people who are a little bit uncertain or, or a little bit sort of naive, switched off to just how ruthless people can be. Um, and I think the other thing is they think every one of you is a millionaire. If you've got a football track suit on, you're a multi-millionaire, <laughs> and you drive a lovely car. I can tell you now, I don't. Um, <laughs> and I think, uh, but but that's fine. That that you know, it's part of it. And there's a lot of rich people that are that are involved oh, yeah. in the game. But at the same time, there's not. But I think. That, that that taught me a hell of a lot. I went down there to work for certain people that I had grown up knowing for a very, very long time. I'd shared a lot of conversations about football, about num- no, numerous things. I'd known them for years and years and years and quickly found out that you can't trust everybody, even if it's someone that's appointed you in a role. Mm. So that, that was a massive eye-opener. Um, but I think it never changed me as a person. It just made me a bit more aware of what people are about. Um, and that when sometimes when, when push comes to shove, it's all about them and not about the people that are around them. And I'd like to think I'd never become like that. So that was a massive one. But in terms of coaching, I learned so much because we trained at a different venue to the under 21s and a different venue to the first team. But every morning we would get a shout of, you know, this player needs to go there or that player needs to go there. Nine times out of 10, I never had any goalkeepers. So the amount of sessions that I devised and planned and structured towards not having goalkeepers was mind-blowing so done incredible amounts for my coaching and I was out on the grass every day yeah. Monday, Tuesday the co- uh, kids went to college on a Wednesday Thursday, Friday and then I obviously would take the team on a Saturday <clears throat> and it was absolutely fantastic for my coaching because you could start to see about things ideas that do work don't work and the massive thing for me was was moving to a place like Bournemouth was was trying to build relationships with kids that I'd never really had a a relationship with. You know, I'd grown up in London with kids that had a bit more of an edge, a bit more mm. feisty, a uh, bit like they're, they're probably thinking, um, who's this guy? <laughs> yeah, who is he? Yeah. And I had to go down there and win them over. And, mm. and and there was some real challenges. And the great thing for me is is that I still speak to a number of those boys that have or haven't cracked on in their careers and yeah you know, doing different things. And I still speak to him now. So it sort of tells me a little bit, although I was only there for slightly less than a year um, because of the way I was treated, I I can hold my head up and say that I did the, the, a good job by, by, by from a personal level as a coach. But at the same time, I won those those lads over and I've, I've built good relationships with them. They've all become men now. And, you know, when I, when I do speak to them, it, it's lovely that you, you've been able to influence their career even if they didn't go on to, to achieve in what they wanted to achieve. So obviously at this point now, or as you said, you've left now, where was the next, did you then go back? You went back to Lake Orient, to, am I correct? No, I went, I went back, I went, I moved, moved back home. Uh, we had to sell our house and, and it, it was, a, it was a tough period, but I moved back home and, I, and I'd done a recruitment job at Norwich. Um, and like I said earlier there, really, I went into the role thinking I could be really good at it and, 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 and gain some success at it. I think the people at Norwich would probably tell you. I, I, I was made redundant again within another year, so it was a very quick turnaround and out of another job. But um, I wasn't very good. I, I wasn't a good scout at the time. Really? Um, I had to teach myself and had to learn how to watch football from a scout's perspective. And that, that was a real surreal experience. I was coming home and saying to my missus, like, I don't understand why this team don't do that or why this coach does this. And it, that weren't my job. My job was to go, watch a player, decide whether he was for us or not, and report on it. And, and I couldn't get my head around it. It took me months and months to, to be able to, to get to grips with that. And, and then the club got relegated and, and like I say, my position was, was made redundant. So uh, I left there. I went back to Tottenham for a little while and I ran like a, they're quite common now, the 16 to 18 college programs where the players train alongside their studies 
Um, and then and then I went to Swindon after that, and that was my first opportunity in professional football. I went there as first team coach. So, how did that kind of come about? Was it again? Was it done off merit? It, it, not in the sense of kind of were you good enough, but were was that who was your head? Who was the manager at that point? Is that why you got brought in? Were you just brought in because they wanted you, or what? Kind of explain a bit more. Uh, yeah, I, I would probably say this is where an element of luck is involved. But then again. I'd, I had um, the, the, the the assistant manager that was there at the time, Luke Williams, had been someone that had taken the under-14s for me at Orient. Um, we become really, really good friends, talked relentlessly about football. Um, both had a common interest in terms of the way we felt the game should be played. Um, and then on top of that, Martin Ling got the manager's job. Um and I'd worked for Martin at Orient. So for years okay. I'd been, you know, I'd, I'd been very, very close to Martin in terms of going and watch the way that he and Dean Smith worked when they were in charge at first team, um, followed his career, you know, went and watched his teams play, stayed in touch with him a lot. Uh, he'd been through some incredibly rough times with his mental health. And I, and I was sort of, I'd like to say that I've you know, really tried to support him through that. And then, he got the so I sort of almost become like the common theme. I went in as first team coach, but there was Martin, who was the manager, and Luke. They didn't particularly really know each other, but I I knew both of them and probably probably brought them together that like that sort of way. But um, again, a bit of a coming together, a number of things, fortune, um, circumstances, massive jump for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I moved first time I moved away from my family, so I was away for three four nights a week. Um, having to stay in Swindon to to commute or to you know to, to to be on top of the place rather than having to travel it every day, so massive responsibility. But that was really the first time where I've really felt right. I want to jump onto something that um, I feel like I want to really have a you know have a go at and try to try to change where maybe my career is going away from youth development. Kind of obviously you touched on it there. Obviously from youth development and kind of your time at Norwich, then coming back, and then obviously. The job at Swindon came along. Kind of go through, and I don't know if you, you probably will to relate a lot, and all coaches in the pro game will. Your first day walking into that training ground, and obviously, obviously, if you're a player and you're, they're like, oh, here's Ross, he's the new first team coach. Oh, well, he didn't play for, he didn't, he, he's not a player. What is, and and yeah. I think a lot of people do look at that and think that doesn't happen. I'm not. Well, it's like any job. If you're working in if you're working in London in the city and your new manager comes in, well, who's this guy? Who's the, is, yeah. How was that? Like, kind of, can you remember that first day? And do you now look yeah, at vividly. On coaches now? Vividly, I remember it. Um, and uh, do you know what? I never thought of it until, the, until that day. So I used to leave my house at five o'clock in the morning on a Monday and drive down to Swindon. And went, Martin, Martin was a manager and he, he only ended up being there as manager for about seven or eight weeks before he went down with with serious mental health again. Um, but I used to drive to his house, pick him up, and we used to drive to drive to Swindon. And I remember pulling up at the training ground. I'd never seen the training ground before. Getting out of the car and thinking, oh, my God, this is real. Like, <laughs> mad. And there was three of us. And um, Luke had been taking the team as, as, as the interim head coach at the time uh, before Martin had, had gone in that Martin had been in there for a week before I joined and I, I got there so the first couple of days it wasn't really me I wasn't really coaching I was, I was sort of more just around trying to get to know people and stuff like that and then I would say probably day three I was asked to take certain players that weren't going to be involved in the team for the weekend and I remember putting on a session and the session was all right and and but I remember coming off thinking it didn't feel right and I couldn't put my finger on it. So I was in the car back to the stadium and I, I was talking to them both and I sort of said, that, something, something weren't right with that today. And went in, done a similar sort of thing the next day and started to realise that because I was who I was, these players were looking at me as if to say, like, right, come in, what have you got? Who are you? What, have you, what do you know? What are you doing here? The majority of the ones that I had weren't in the team um, for the weekend. So they were obviously a bit disgruntled. And I remember thinking, I've got to try and win this lot over. I've got to try and show them that I'm all right and show them that 
I'm a decent bloke and then I might be able to show them that I know what I'm talking about yeah, when yeah. I'm talking about a coaching session. So that was a bit that I started to do. I tried to try to sort of almost, almost go back to like the start of, yeah. of like make it fun, make it enjoyable, make it something they want to be part of. And don't get me wrong. It was, I didn't walk in the next day and it was all fine because people were disgruntled and they were unhappy players, not in the team. But slowly I started to try to show them the type of person that I was and that I was trying to put the session on to make it a good environment for them. And then as that sort of evolved and they, and they started to accept me as a bloke a little bit more, I could then so and be a bit more creative and, and a little bit more thoughtful in the types of sessions or drills or, what, or whatever it was that I was going to put on to, to, you know, for them as players. Do you think that that kind of you had touched it there, which a lot of people might think is weird in terms of you as an individual and them actually liking you for the bloke you are, was that the hardest bit to kind of get your head around? Like they just need to like me first before anything. Yeah, I think, you know, it's a good word, like, but I think that's a word that I got thrown at me when I took the the, the head coach role on here is that uh, all the players like him. He's got a good relationship with people. The key for me is that they respect you and that they um, they are willing to go with what you say or what you're asking them to do. So, yeah, we all want to be liked. You know, like, if you ask anyone, do they want to be, you'd rather be liked than disliked, wouldn't you? But at the same time, I think it's, it's more about trying to build relationships with people that even if they're not overly keen on you as a person, they respect what you're trying to say and they respect what it is you're asking them to do. And then you get more of a, a tune out of people. Then, then, then now I think if you, if people like you, then you get more out of people. Oh, or if people, you know, if you, you look at Klopp and Pep and, you know, identify them as the very, very top at it. But if they, they, they seem as though they build like a real rapport, real love for their, with their players. Then I feel then you're even on a, you know, on an even bigger thing because you get more out of people um, and you'll get more out of anybody. And again, it don't, it's not related to football. You touched on there about working in an office. If you walk in and you get, get that motivation out of people, then you, you get more out of it if they, if they like you and respect mm. you. Do you know what I mean? So I think it was more about showing them what I was about then them almost sort of going, oh yeah, he's all right, or yeah, he's you know he's trying to help us, or yeah, come on, he's trying, he's showing, he's showing enthusiasm in the session, so mm-hmm. we need to give it a little bit more, and and then you can start to manipulate your coaching a little bit more. So I was quite careful with the sessions that I put on, to be honest, but that could only start to grow once I once I showed them what I was about. Cool, because I, I sit there and think now, and obviously I've not been in that environment myself, but you, you can. I think a lot of people, and you probably be able to, obviously you won't say any names, but you'll be able to look at coaches that you might know or see in the league and stuff and think, you're overcomplicating it so much. If you can get the very, very basics of, does that put like respect, like we said, kind of, do they accept what you're doing? Are they willing to run through yeah. rules for you? Regardless of your philosophy, whatever, it kind of, I think like you said, touching it, it's the, it's the biggest point, but, you're yeah, right. and you know, like, that's no different for you than it is for me, than it is for somebody that's working at the top, is that when I started coaching, my job was to get kids to come back to my session on a Saturday morning. My job was for when parents turned up, that their kids would get in the car and tell them what a great day they had. Yeah. So as mental as that seems from t- sending a team out on a Saturday afternoon in League Two to try and get a result, it couldn't seem any further apart. No. But actually, the... The, re- the, the skills that it takes to do that are quite simple. It's mm-hmm. ultimately about getting people to go and do what you want them to do. And, and I think I was lucky enough to have to practice that and, yeah. and do that with, with a five-year-old that didn't want to be there, that had no idea and no interest in football. But I needed him to come back because we wanted his mum and dad to pay the money for him to come <laughs> on our camps. We wanted him to enjoy coming yeah. on our courses. Like, all of those sorts of things. And it had a bigger, you know, bigger motivation for you know, for, for where else you might see them around, around the other things that you operate. So I think it's, it's about getting a tune out of people. If you manage people, it's about getting people to respond and, and react and, and perform under what you're asking them to do. And that, for me, is relatable to the industry that we both love, but mm-hmm. any other industry that you, might, that you might come to work in. Definitely. And you, you touched on it there. So 
we've been at Swindon now. You then get the opportunity to go back to, I would say, your boy, your boyhood club, the place where yeah. you, you love. And, and, and it's like anything. When you, you're coming to work a job, but if it's like, like you said, it's, it's your job, it's your team, it's like, right. So talk us through that. So you're there now. Obviously, you've had the experience at Swindon. Yeah. And now you've stepped in back at Leighton Orient as, was it, were you assistant manager or first team manager? Yeah. So I was assistant manager, assistant coach was the yeah. title, but assistant manager. So there was the club had just been taken over, had been relegated to the National League. I went in as assistant coach. There was no head coach appointed. We had nine players. There was no squad that was, was absolutely on its knees. Um, what did you think at that point? It, it was like massively eye-opening. Massively, massively eye-opening. The club was absolutely, had been treated so badly by the previous owners that the new owners had come in and really wanted to regenerate it, needed to regenerate it because there was nothing left. Um, and I remember turning up at the training ground. Pre-season was about 10 days old, so we were going back 10 days later than everybody else. We started our first day of pre-season with nine players. Um, we didn't know what, how many balls we had. We didn't know where any of the equipment was. We didn't know what was going to be left there. It was, it was, it was, uh, it was hilarious, really. But... Um, an amazing feeling to go back to a club that I had, like I said to you earlier, it's five, six years old, had gone on the first ever football camp. And then all of a sudden yeah. I was going out there to try to get it back on its, you know, back on, back on a level. Um, and we built it up from like we say, next to nothing to, um, it was very, very difficult in that first season. But once, once the new manager, Steve Davis was, was appointed, um, we settled things down a little bit. Um, we, we had quite a good start to the season and then we really, really tailed off. Um, had a few injuries and I think that lack of pre-season and preparation really caught up with everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, and unfortunately, Steve lost his job around November time um, and I stepped in for three games as, as interim manager, which again was incredibly surreal to be standing on the touchline manager of a club that I'd, I'd had a season ticket for. Um and I'd sat in the stadium with you know my dad and my granddad and my nan and they've got mates and in the crowd and everyone point. and it was yeah yeah <laughs> and you know what the amazing feeling was as well is that living in Swindon you now my dad and my family were incredibly supportive my missus and my kids used to come as much as they could but Swindon was a long way away mm. um, so to be able to look behind the dugout just before kick off and see like my wife and kids and my mum and dad, my brothers, and you know all that. You know all that. Sort of, that's without anybody else around there, but family and friends that were so close, and 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 then the club that means so much to you. So that was that was incredible. And then, um, and then Justin Edinburgh was was appointed as as uh, as the manager after that, which was uh, he was an incredible person to work for. That season, where obviously, obviously you end up getting promoted, and everything like that. As a, as a coach, and obviously, like you said, the, the relationship, and I've seen many videos of um, yourself, Justin, and I can't remember the other guy's name, um, on Leighton Orient's... Yeah, Danny um, Webb. Yeah, on their yeah. channel. And yeah. you can tell it's... Obviously, you were formed together, but it's, it's all because you love the game and, and you love each other, really, if that makes sense. And yeah, yeah, what, you do, yeah. What was that, that journey like when you turn around and... and you, a win on a Tuesday, a win on a Saturday, a win, a win, and you're and you're looking at the league yeah. and you're thinking, where, like, do you look back at you, you, you then as an individual at the time, obviously being assistant manager, do you look back and think, I was literally academy or doing development and doing other sessions around me, and now I'm on the, at the time, obviously when you got promoted, it was, it's crazy. Obviously you can tell more about that, but what was that looking back for yourself as just as an individual, not as a team? I think the individual thing is is you don't achieve you don't achieve what we achieve without it being a collective. Mm-hmm. But like you say, from an individual perspective, it was um, surreal in many parts. We we me and Justin and Danny, like you say, were very much sort of brought together, um, thrown together, and we built up a real common interest in terms of our you know our, our personalities. But what you know how Justin wanted to work had a real focus and, and, and belief in, in the way that he wanted things done. Um, and it was really, it was really strange because we got relegated at Swindon before I lost my job and it was struggle after struggle after struggle the whole, you know, the whole time I was there. And I remember thinking nothing can ever be as bad as this. 
Mm. And we went there and, and touched on about that first season being hard in the National League. But then when Just come in and we, and we, we got safe and, and built for the start of that next season, when those first, we went unbeaten for 13, 14 games at the start of the season. And it was like so enjoyable. You mm. turn up, the first three games, we drew the first three games of the season, and people were questioning our start. And then we just went and, and, and we had a real good run and we, look, we just looked really, really strong and the togetherness and the belief was incredible. Um, but the, fir- like the first 13, 14 games, it was so enjoyable because you just felt invincible. We just felt wherever we went, we were going to have enough to cope with whatever anybody had to throw at us physically, from a football sense. It, we, would, we, just, we just felt in, in, indestructible. And then it got to probably Christmas, just into the new year. And it sort of never become enjoyable again. It was a great <laughs> place to go to work. But then all of a sudden... When the, when the realism hits you that you can achieve something and people start to expect, supporters, mm. you know, the club, uh, yourselves, you all start to think, hang on a minute, we might be able to achieve something. Until the day we won the league, no one talked about winning the league. We all talked about we could do something special mm. if, if what we all want happens. That was how we all referred to it. So no one actually said if we win the league. No one actually said when we win the league. It was all if we achieve this or if we get to where we want to get to. But it become, the closer and closer we got, the worse it got. I'd get on the coach after games and we might have drawn and we'd be, still be top of the league. But I'd sit in there on the coach for 15, 20 minutes trying to get my head round, like, what's the next game? The mm. pressure was incredible. It's like um, you said, it's that, it's that if, isn't it? It's yeah. You're like, if we achieve this, but then, like you said, when, when you've drawn away, you're still top of the league, but it's like, what if we now don't get promoted? It's like, what if on that? Exactly. On the and well? then, yeah. And what was quite interesting for us as well was we also got to Wembley. We lost in the trophy final at Wembley. But um, in, in the National League, if you have a run in the cup, your games, the, the trophy games get played on a Saturday and you move your games to a Tuesday. So we were playing like Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday. And every time we played a, a trophy game and won, you'd get back on the coach like, oh my God, one step closer to Wembley. But then you'd look at the league table or someone had mentioned that <laughs> Stalford had done this or Solly O had done that and you'd think, oh my God, we're somehow we're still top and they've all lost today or, or they won or we've gone second. You know, like the, 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 the intensity and the pressure was just so... Mm so much um but we just we, when it got to the back end of the season we just sort of kept finding out finding a way to win and uh and and, and uh, mind-blowing mind-blowing feeling to, to to win a league and and do it with the club that you've that you've been part of and also to do it with a club that you've been part of but a club that was absolutely on its knees Mm. To see it be built up from those that first day of pre-season training where we didn't know what was going on to to, to winning the league in such a short period of time mm. was mm. was an unbelievable achievement by everyone at the club. But but something that no matter what I go on to achieve in my career that I'll never ever forget. And and be, it shouldn't go unsaid that the big part of that is is the relationship that I built with with Justin. Mm. I remember looking back. Was it? What was your second last game? Was it Solly Hall away? Yeah. Or who was it? Yeah. yeah. And I remember. Yeah, Solly Hall away. Yeah. I remember at the time. Obviously, it was all coming on, and and I was. I asked for Liverpool, so the season was done. There was nothing else really going on, and I looked down. I think, oh, like they're on the way, and then all of a sudden, I see um, you win away, and then everyone's like clapping the fans, and all of a sudden, you're coming over like an absolute bull in the china shop. At that moment, do you look back and think? Can we start to believe now? <laughs> Do you know what? It was mad, right? It was the worst game of football I've ever watched. <laughs> it was terrible. And uh, with about four, four or five minutes to go, the guy, one of our boys lost his marker and the guy misses an header from four yards. And I remember thinking, oh my God, we might do this. It's going to happen. <laughs> um, yeah. And then I don't know if it was just before or just after, shot went in and the goalie, our goalie sat on it and it rolled behind him like it looked like it was going to be the slowest goal ever and he managed to turn around and get his hands on it and I started thinking we, we I think we might do this mm. it was a horrible horrible feeling you just wanted to get over it like I say terrible game never felt like anyone was ever in any sort of control 
And when the final whistle went, we didn't know what had happened. And like you said, once we started to realise, we were like seven goals, I think it was, better off. We were three points clear. We just needed to not get beat 7-0 by Braintree in the last game <laughs> of the season. Um, so I, I lost myself for like 30 seconds in terms of going to celebrate and then thought, no, no. Oh, God, we ain't yeah. done it yet. Like, <laughs> we've got to go for another whole week and then another 90 minutes of of this same feeling as today. And, and I'm never... Do you know what? Even though probably 50, 60 minutes in, fans started celebrating that last game of the season that, that we'd done it because Salford were losing or the circumstances yeah. were, were, were what they were. I still couldn't enjoy it. I yeah. couldn't enjoy it. People coming up and patting me on the back next to the dugout waiting to invade the pitch. You're still and just... I just couldn't celebrate. The mix of emotions was, was, was mind-blowing. So you obviously, at this point, you get promoted, obviously, like we, you just touched on an amazing feeling there. And then you've, at what point, obviously, when it's finished and everything, do you, obviously, all coaches are different, do you allow yourself to kind of properly disconnect? Obviously, you've just won it and everything. Do you, as you as an individual, do you start thinking ahead or are you just still in, I'm a late, at this moment, I'm a late and Orient fan, I've just got promoted. Is it, are you still? No, I think, yeah, I think we had, um, we had a mental like week, celebrations, um, it, it, which I think you have to do. You yeah. have to let your hair down. You have to enjoy the moments because this could potentially be the only one in my career that I get. So, um, you want to be able to enjoy it. And we did. We had a fantastic... The next day, we had an unbelievable end-of-season player, player of the year dinner. And we, I was on a table dancing with fans. And, you know, it was, it was the best. And that week, the boys went away to Marbella. Me and Justin never went. But the boys and the staff all went away to Marbella to celebrate. Um, and then we, we were still preparing for the trophy final, which was about three weeks after the season had ended. Mm-hmm. Uh, so our focus was very much on that for the two weeks in the build-up to, to that game. Um, we lost that. We had a big end of season party celebration for all the staff and the fan uh, staff and families, which was again was was amazing and something you never forget. But um, after that, we all were going on holiday. Um, but while even while we were on holiday, me and Justin were speaking about players and you know what what, what potentially we might need to do with with regards to recruitment and that. So it does quickly turn into getting back to normal and 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 trying to build and get better or, or sustain what you're doing. And then obviously, obviously a terrible thing obviously happened with Justin obviously passing away. Yeah. And then you get into the next season, you obviously, as a club, as a, as a business, as a, as, a, as a family, like you say, it's, it's a very different scenario. At what point did you look at it? And obviously, I believe Carl Fletcher got the job as Leighton Orient manager. And then that didn't obviously that changed after a very, very short time. And then you get given the job, obviously on a, on a full-time basis. How is that from an emotional standpoint as a coach, but also as a, as a best friend, and now you're in charge of it, when two weeks ago, three weeks ago, it was, we're all doing this together. What, Yeah, it's probably a very hard thing to answer, but what is that like? No, it, it, it is a tough thing to answer. And I think even now, having gone... I couldn't sit there and say, Chair, this is what we've done. We just tried to find a way. We just tried to discover what it was. To, and, and my phrase all the time to people is, we've just got to try and find normal again, whatever that looks like, however we get there, however long it takes. Mm-hmm. So that was always our mindset um, to try to do that. And then we got to a certain stage in the season and the club wanted to make the role permanent. And I didn't feel as though I was in the, in the right place to be, to be a head coach. Um, it wasn't something that I wanted to do and obviously then you say Carl came in and, and it didn't quite work out I took it back on as, as an interim coach and then, and then the club really showed me a lot of belief and confidence that I probably should have thought about myself a little bit more and and um, I suppose like anything the longer you're in a position that you're not quite sure about you know if you feel as though you're doing doing quite well at it it, it can evolve into something and that's as, as simple as it was really we we looked as if we were starting to stabilise ourselves, even though the results weren't always great. Um, and then, and then, sort of, certain powerful, big people at the club sort of, you know, 
made it known as to what their thoughts were on on me taking up the role as a head coach, and and I did. Now, obviously, like obviously, you you kind of come to realization that you were like, no, I want to do this now. It's like you said, they've shown you the faith. Yeah. You want to do this, and then you're now you're there now, and obviously, you you obviously this coronavirus and everything happens, and I think you guys are in a, a an all right position for what you would have yeah. probably thought at the beginning. Looking back on the whole season, obviously to this point as a whole, do you think that every single thing that we spoke about today has accumulated to this moment and you still use bits of your time when you were really, really young, like we said, to now your relationship as a coaching team to now your first team manager? Do you think you've used all elements of your journey to now? I'd like to think so. I'd like to think so. I think, um, I, don't know, I look at even like looking at simple things like little sessions and whatever, little warm ups and that that I do. I, I, I would have done them with, you know, with some of the babies that, I, that, I, that, I've, that, I've, that I've coached across the years. So, you know, the, the, the skills, I suppose, all, all relate and cross over in some way, shape or form. And I think sometimes because you're working with, because you're working with men or you're working with pros you think well I can't really do that with them because they're pros and it's only really their status that stops you doing it you yeah. do it and you look around as much as a smile on their faces as there was with, with, with the six and seven year olds that you didn't with originally so I think from that perspective definitely I think the biggest thing that I've learned is it, again I've touched on it before but it's about the relationships that you build with people I had incredible relationships with the players because of what we'd achieved and then obviously what we went through with losing just but then at the same time I've then had to I suppose, manipulate and change my relationship with them because I'm making big decisions about them and their, you know, them being in and out of the team and, 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 and their careers to a degree. Yeah. So I have to have a different viewpoint and stance on that, albeit maintaining the, the relationships that I've got with them. So it was definitely a challenge, definitely things that probably hung over me in the outset with it all. Um, but I think the more time I've spent in it, the more comfortable I've, I've become, I think, Certainly, I noticed a massive shift for me and the staff and the players when I became the head coach on a full-time basis. I, there was definitely a change in terms of the way that people treated me. Mm -hmm. um, my jokes weren't quite as funny, if they ever were <laughs> as funny before, but you walked into a room and you have a bit of a different, different presence within yeah. that room now. Um, but I suppose the longer I've been doing it, the more comfortable I've become with it. I know that you know people are not going to, have a text conversation with me about Man City, Liverpool when I'm sitting at home like they did before because perhaps they see it as a different thing because I might leave them out of the weekend. I don't, I don't know exactly what the dynamics are of that, but all I can say is I've sort of grown into that and I believe that the way that I treat people is always fair. I try and be honest with them. Um, I try and tell people what I think and, and ultimately that's all, all you can do. People are not going to be happy with your decision, certainly if it's one that means that you're leaving them out. But... Um, Ultimately, if you're honest and straight, that's all you can ever be with people. And I, and I think it gives you an opportunity to, to get better. Amazing, mate. So last question, which I want to leave on every single one of my of, of our podcasts that we do is when all when we're back to normal in years to come and you look back at your time as a coach, but as a manager as a whole, to get to the highest level, in my opinion, to the pro level where you're at now, what's the one thing you want to look back on and go, if someone says to you, what was Ross like? Or what did you think of Ross? What's the one thing you want to be remembered for as a manager and as a coach? I think, I think you win everything, be great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, the, the biggest thing for me is what we just touched on there, really. I think I, I, like that, that, that people would say that I'm honest, that I'm straight, that I'm, that I'm fair, and, and that I take everyone into consideration when I'm making decisions. I don't, you know, don't feel as though there's anyone right now that could say that I, that I make people's lives difficult. You know, I, I try to think of every different scenario and every different player. And, and I think the, the big thing as well is that I've always maintained in any job that I've been in is that you want to make work a happy and enjoyable place to come into. I mean, if you get that, you've got a very good chance of all the other bits bolting on to the outside of, uh, of what you want to be. So I think, I think I'd like to think that in time when people look back, they'd like to say that, that I'm that as a person, but then at the same time that I create a, uh, a place of work where, where you love coming into. It's amazing. Ross, 
thank you so much, mate, for coming on and being the first person on. It's been a privilege to talk. No, and I hope everyone... Privileged. Privileged. That's Look back lit- in time, mate, and know I've been the, the first one. <laughs> exactly, mate. Hopefully it's more of many. Um, I hope everyone that was listening to it and obviously on our YouTube that's watched it, anything else you want to see more, please comment, everything like that. And please check myself out on my football page on Instagram. It's obviously JP underscore football training. And please, yeah, hope you've all enjoyed it. And yeah, hopefully we'll all be back to football soon. Thank you.